Hello and welcome to this video on Rylands and Fletcher Torts. This video is going to focus on the theory. If you're looking for application, that will be on a separate video. Okay, so straight in with an introduction of Rylands and Fletcher Tort. So this is an extension of nuisance. Now nuisance is where land is affected by something intangible, so something which you can't touch. We've seen like fumes, smells and so on. Now claims under Rylands and Fletcher or the rule from Rylands and Fletcher are where property is destroyed or damaged by something that comes onto the property from an adjoining property. So one of the famous quotes from Mr. Justice Blackburn in the case, the eponymous case Rylands and Fletcher, uh, we think that the true rule of law is that the person for who, for the purposes of his own, brings on his land and keeps there anything likely to do mischief if it escapes, must keep it in at his peril, and if he does not do so, he is prima facie answerable for the, all the damage which is a natural consequence of its escape. So this definition uh, basically contains all the major requirements for this tort. Now one more facet was added by Lord Cairns on appeal in this case, and this was the thing brought onto land must amount to non-natural use of the land. But these elements have developed over time, so wherever there was a claim, um, obviously these elements will have been looked at in detail and what we're going to see, particularly through, for example, Cambridge Water Companies in East and Leather Counties, is that some elements have been changed. For example, this damage does need to be foreseeable now, which brings it in line with all the other torts. Now, it's a strict liability tort and the defendant could still be liable if he tried to prevent it from escaping, so the thing which was stored on the land from escaping. So strict liability. And of course we need to establish first who can claim. So the parties in the claim then the person who can take action must have an interest in the land, so similar to nuisance in that they have an interest in it, so you can own, rent or have some sort of proprietary interest in it. Now this of course means that partners and so on of the owners will not be able to claim similarly to in nuisance claims. Now the defendant will be an owner or occupier of the land who satisfies the four ingredients of the tort. So it's the person usually in an adjoining property who has some control over the land. So we're going to look at the essential elements now. So a quick introduction to the case itself from which this rule comes is Rounds and Fletcher. So the defendant here was a mill owner and he hired contractors to create a reservoir on his land to act as a water supply to the mill. Now the contractors negligently failed to block off disused mine shafts that they came across during their excavations. Now unknown to the contractors, these shafts were connected to other mine works on an adjoining land and when the reservoir was filled, water then flooded neighbouring mines. So here the defendant had people do work on his property which then flooded, so this water flooded uh, someone else's property, did the mines. And so we got four elements uh, as identified in that case. So we have the bringing onto the land an accumulation or storage of an item. So in this case we can see the water was brought onto and stored on the land. Now the thing must do, it must be likely to cause mischief if it escapes. And here we have a large volume of water can of course do damage if it escapes. Um, and it must be, amount to a non-natural use of the land. Now the storage amounted to the non-natural use of land because there was not water there in the beginning. So of course creating a reservoir is a non-natural use of land because it wasn't a reservoir uh, beforehand. Now which does escape then and causes reasonably foreseeable damage to the, to the adjoining property? So it has to, not only does it escape but the damage needs to be foreseeable like we've already said in line with other torts the, needs, the damage needs to be foreseeable. Now in this case water did escape through the mine shafts and it caused considerable damage. So reiterate then the essential elements of the tort. We're going to deal with each of these in turn. We're going to explain each of the elements and see how the case law proves our points in those regards. So the first element is the bringing onto a land and accumulation of storage. We have then of a thing likely to cause mischief if it escapes. 
The third element is which amounts to non-natural use of land, and of course which does escape and causes reasonably foreseeable damage to the adjoining property. And we're going to deal with this first one, the bringing onto the land and accumulation or storage. So what this means is then the substance is brought and stored, but it's not naturally present on the land. So if it already exists there, then it will not be considered to be brought onto the land. So no liability if it's naturally present or if it accumulates. So for example, in Giles and Walker, it weeds spreading with natural and thus there is no liability. So you might see this in cases where, for example, there is Japanese knotweed. Uh, Ellison and the Ministry of Defence, uh, rainwater accumulating was natural and there is no liability for when the rainwater escaped and caused damage. So we can trust that to Rounds and Fletcher. Of course, creating a reservoir for the mill that was non-natural use because it was a deliberate accumulation in that case. Looking at a couple of cases now, so Miles and Forest Granite of Leicestershire and Company. Um, in this case, explosives kept on land were detonated to break up some rocks. And some of the rocks were forced into the air and escaped the defendant's property and injured the claimant. Now, the explosives caused the rocks to escape the property and the defendant was held to be liable. Now, a quick note here, this would not occur in the same way anymore because we're not, um, can't claim for physical injury from rounds of lead to torch, you'd have to claim in another way. So it could be negligence or nuisance, for example. So looking at the second element then of a thing likely to cause mischief if it escapes. What this means is that the thing which escapes is likely to cause some damage. So it is a test of foreseeability. It is the damage and not the escape, which must be foreseeable if it is to escape. So it's not the idea that it was foreseeable that the thing is going to escape. It's foreseeable that if the thing escapes, it will cause damage. So examples of the things which are courts considered can do mischief are things like gas and electricity. If they escape, they can cause damage. Poisonous fumes, a flagpole, tree branches, and an occupied chair in a chair plane ride. So coming on to the idea of a chair plane ride, as you can see in the image, a, this is a chair plane, uh, if you're unfamiliar. And now a chair plane ride in Hale and Jennings Brothers um, on the fairground ride became detached from the main assembly whilst in motion and injured a stall holder as it crashed to the ground. Now the owner of the ride here is liable as there was a risk of injury was foreseeable if the car came loose. Now this is one of the few cases where a claim for personal injury using Ryland and Fletcher was successful, um, but this would no longer be possible after the decision in Transco PLC and Stockport NBC. And in Transco PLC in Stockport NBC, a water pipe took water to a block of flats owned by a council. Now unknown to anybody, the pipe had failed and water was escaping. Now this water caused an embankment to collapse and leave a gas main exposed and unsupported. The gas company took the council to court to recover the cost of repairing their gas main and it was accepted by the House of Lords that the council had not been negligent. The case was decided using the rule in Rylands and Fletcher instead. So the House of Lords decided in, in the favour of the council because the supply of water through the pipes was normal and did not create a special hazard. Now a quick note here on the difference between negligence and rounds and Fletcher. Neg negligence, of course, we need a, 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 need a duty of care, a breach of duty and causation. So we've got an element of fault here, whereas this is a strict liability tort. So we just prove if it's happened, there is liability. So that's the difference between the two there. And then read in line, some explosives detonated in the munitions factory, killing one person and injuring the others. There was no evidence of negligence and the case was decided using the rule of Rounds and Fletcher. It was held that by the House of Lords that no liability arose because the persons injured were on the premises and there was no escape from the factory. So there was no escape in this case. On the third element, which amounts to a non-natural use of land, so we've looked at already in Rallens and Fletcher, um, the idea of building a reservoir is a non-natural use. You're going to see several examples in your exams here. 
Now, if the defendant's uh, not stopping at the natural use of their clothes, had desired to use it for any purpose, which I may term in non-natural use, and in consequence of doing so, the water came to escape, then it appears to me that which the defendants were doing, they were doing they were at their peril. So we've got then an idea. This is Lord Cairns from Rounds of Fletcher. If you're doing something which is not natural, then you are responsible if it escapes. So another case to illustrate this point is Rickards and Lothian. In this case, water had escaped from an overflow pipe connected to a wash basin, with the tap had been left running, and the wash basin's waste pipe had been blocked by an unknown person. Now, the Judicial Committee, the Privy Council, held that the water from the overflow pipe did not involve the natural use of land. It was also accepted that the damage was caused by a third party, um, and the concept was developed and explained in Rickles and Lothian, as we've mentioned in, the, in this case. Um, it is not every use of land which brings into play this principle. It must be some special use, bringing with it an increased danger to others, not merely by the ordinary use of land or such is use as is proper for the general benefit of the community. So what we're saying uh, is, in this particular set of circumstances, wash basin was not a non-natural use of land. So if we've got that element of fault, if we're going to make something blameworthy for Rylance and Fletcher torts, we do need it to be an unusual use of land, so it won't be something ordinary. But it is a complex uh, idea, and it can obviously change over time. So for example, a car with a tank, a car with a tank full of petrol was considered non-natural in Musgrove and Pandellis in 1919, but now that would be absurd. So case law indicates non-natural use should be extraordinary or unusual. Now domestic uses will not be non-natural, so therefore we would not have claims for Rounds and Fletcher for, un for an ordinary use of land. So in your exams, you're going to see things like storing of oil or particular flammable liquids or something like that, which is unusual to keep on domestic properties. Now, some examples uh, we've seen in case law is fire in a grate which spreads to the claimant's land, a defective wiring that causes a fire which spreads to the claimant's premises, and a domestic water supply. So all of these things on natural use of land would be non-natural, so therefore the claim would fail in these cases. Another key case, British Selenese and Hunt. Um, the defendants stored strips of metal foil, which were used in the process of manufacturing electrical components. Some of these strips of foil blew off the defendant's land and onto an electricity substation causing power failures. And it was held that the use of this land was natural. This was partly because of the benefit derived from the manufacturer by the public, and there was no liability under the rule as a result, but they were liable in both negligence and nuisance, just not in violence and Fletcher. So you may see um, this particular issue come up alongside other issues in your exams, for example, with negligence or with nuisance, and then you may find that this is successful or not, and the other is the opposite. So of course, be careful to do that in your exam. Now, the court have accepted that certain activities will always lead to a potential level of danger if we look at Cambridge Water and Eastern Counties Leather. So, in this case, um, the facts are the Cambridge Water Company provided water to the whole of Cambridge, and in 1976 they purchased a borehole. Now, in 1980, a European directive was issued which controlled the presence of PCE, which is a toxic chemical in water and the borehole was found to be contaminated with PCE that had come from a tannery owned by Eastern Counties Leather. Now the contamination was caused by an occasional small spillages which eventually soaked through a concrete floor until eventually entering a underground water supply. Now the House of Lords accepted that the storage of PCE by the defendants was a non-natural use of this land. And finally Moving on to the fourth element. So this is the idea that which the thing does escape and causes reasonably foreseeable damage to the adjoining property. So just remember with this one, it needs to escape and it needs to cause reasonably foreseeable damage. There's really two parts to this. So if the substance doesn't move from one pot property to another, there could be no liability. As we've looked at in Reed's 
So this rule isn't always strictly applied. We've seen in Hale and Jennings Brothers when both stores had uh, were on land and they didn't know. And indeed, they were both on the same land, so it didn't escape. But liability was imposed. So, of course, this wouldn't be decided in the same way anymore because there was some physical injury as opposed to um, the land being harmed in a way. Now, Reed and Lyons, as we discussed earlier with the munitions and Transco, have been approved as well. Now, rounds of Fletcher Tort required proprietary interest in the land being specific form of nuisance. And the House of Lords in Cambridge Water and Eastern Counties Leather introduced that second part, the requirement that damage must be reasonably foreseeable. So a, a case which illustrates the idea of foreseeable damage is Cambridge Water and Eastern Counties Leather. We've already dealt with the facts of this case before, the idea of the chemical spillages seeping into the concrete floor and into the soil, and of course then onto the water for the local population. Now, this involved the company then spending over a million pounds in moving its operations because of the contaminated water. And the water company wanted to claim the expenses from the owners of the factory. But the House of Lords decided that the damage was not reasonably foreseeable. And indeed, the water or the damaged water was too remote from the site of the spillage. So this will be familiar. This kind of concept will be familiar to you if you've studied negligence already. But indeed, it was too remote and not reasonably foreseeable, so there was no liability for the particular damage. Now we can compare the two following cases. We're going to look at LMS International Land Standard and look at the idea of Rands of Fletcher Torch, which were this time caused by fire. In the first case, LMS International, which we're going to look at, the claimant was successful. And in the second, the claimant was not successful on appeal. So LMS International Styrene Packaging and Insulation. The Defenders Factory here contained a large quantity of flammable material which was stored close to hot wire cutting machines. Now a fire broke out and spread to the claimant's adjoining property. All of the fire services arrived within minutes of being called. The claimants brought an action based on rounds of ledger, nuisance and negligence for damage to his property. Now it was held that as the defendant had accumulated things which were a known fire risk, it was liable in rounds of Fletcher. Now storage of the flammable items represented a recognisable risk to the claimant and the non-natural use of the land. So the defendant was also liable in negligence and nuisance. So once again you can see there may be multiple claims within any particular situation as you may be faced with in your exam. In Stanard and Gore, the defendant here stored tyres in relation to his tyre fitting business. A fire broke out and spread rapidly, causing damage to the claimant's adjoining premises. The trial judge found that the defendant was not negligent, but was strictly liable to the claimant in Rylands and Fletcher. Now, the judge found out that the tyres are not in themselves normally flammable, but they did have a special fire risk, so that if a fire did develop, the tyres might ignite, and if they did, they may burn rapidly and intensely. Now further, the tyres were stored in a haphazard manner and in a large quantity for the size of the premises. In this case, the storage of tyres in this particular situation presented an exceptionally high risk of danger and was a non-natural use of land. So in the case of Wyvern, Lord Justice Ward now adopted this rule. Damage by fire can will no longer be rounds of Fletcher tort or strict libel under that. And this is quite simply because the thing which had been brought onto the land needs to be the thing which escapes. Now think about it in these cases, it wasn't the tyre that escaped, it was the fire that escaped. So it needs to be the tyre in that particular situation. Now while fire may be dangerous thing, the occasions when fire as such is brought onto the land may be limited to cases where fire has been deliberately or negligently started by the occupier or one for whom is responsible. Now, in any event, starting a fire in one's land may well be an ordinary use of land. We can see that people have fire grates in their gardens and so on, or fire heaters, very popular at the moment. Now, it could be difficult to blame fire damage as proof of negligence, so um, maybe negligence would be a better claim. 
So they are then the key elements to the tool. Make sure you apply each and every one of those to any particular scenario. There is a separate video on how to apply this. But don't forget also we need to raise defences. Now some defences you will have looked at when covering negligence and occupiers liability for example. But there are some which are specific to nuisance claims and rounds of Fletcher torts. So there are some defences destroyed um, of course despite the fact that rounds and Fletcher torts are actually strict liability offences or torts. We have Valenti which is consent. So this is one you will have covered in your negligence and occupies liability studies. We have the act of a stranger, an act of God, statutory authority which we've covered in nuisance and of course contributory negligence which we've covered in defence to negligence and of course occupies liability. We'll go through each of these briefly. So we have Valenti, so the general rule with this is there will be no liability when the claimant has consented to do the thing that is accumulated by the defendant. So if there's an element of consent or the person has allowed the person or agreed the person could accumulate the thing, then this would be considered valenti. The act of a stranger, okay, so the defendant may not be liable if he has no control over the act of a stranger. So you should look to Perry and Kendrick's transport as an example for this. There's an act of God, so this is usually extreme weather conditions that no reasonable human foresight can provide against. Now this usually will be something like a storm or a thunderstorm and it may lead to a leakage of something which seeps onto someone else's property or carries something from one person's property to another, damaging it in the... Uh, yeah, so damaging that particular property. Now, it's only likely to succeed if the weather conditions themselves are unforeseeable. So for example, if you know there is going to be a storm, then you should be taking precautions to make sure things don't fly from your property. In terms of statutory authority, now if the terms of an act of parliament authorise the defendant's action, now this may amount to a defence. Now this could also be planning permission, for example, um, of course from a local authority, which usually get the uh, authority from the Act of Parliament anyway. But of course what we've got then is this idea of if they're allowed to do it, it may be a defence to a claim despite it being strict liability. And of course contributory negligence is one which you will have used before. So where the claimant is partially responsible for the escape of the thing, then the Law Reform Contributory Negligence Act ap applies and the damages may be reduced to the amount of the claimant's fault. So this, as you may know, is up to 100%. And finally, once we've established all elements of the tort exist and whether any defences are applicable or not, then we must consider remedies. Now, a claimant must show damage to or destruction of his or her property in order to succeed in a claim for damages. So we need an element of proof that the thing is destroyed. Now in your scenarios, of course, you're going to have the situation where it tells you so. Now the level of damages will be the cost of repair or, repair or replacement. So this isn't compensation to uh, for loss of amenity or loss of earnings or something like we have in in negligence, for example. This is simply making the thing right again, and that is of course the whole idea of remedies in tort law anyway is to put the claimant back in the position they would have been in had the tort not occurred and it's no different for this particular tort. Okay so that's the end of this video um, if you're looking to look for a video which has application that does exist also elsewhere on this channel so please take a look at that if you wish to use it. Thank you for watching.